Maggie. I'm one of the educators at the Florida School of Holistic Living. And today we're in my garden to talk about a plant that's very near and dear to my heart called lemon balm or Melissa officinalis. And you'll see it here in the Lamiaceae family, this beautiful mint family plant. Melissa means is a Greek term used to describe a nymph who shared the wisdom of the honeybee. The pollinators love it. Um, I've read tale that sometimes beekeepers will use it uh, to help the bees to stay calm while they're working with the hive. It has these heart-shaped um, leaves that are opposite. And just like other plants in the mint family, it has this nice square stem. Hi, Mom. Hi, Janice. Okay. When we're thinking about using lemon balm, it's the aerial parts that we use, and it smells fantastic. So one of my favorite ways to use it um, is in a heat. We'll talk about my second favorite way in a little while, but before that, I just want to share with you some of the properties of lemon balm. It's much like other plants in the mint family. It's both um, cooling and drying. It has um, mild antispasmodic qualities. Um, it's definitely aromatic, and a lot of your aromatic plants are going to be helpful in digestion, so helping your body burp instead of fart, um, and just keeping things moving the way they should. It's also considered a relaxing nerving. So lemon balm, I like to describe as this plant that is like getting a really good hug. It's relaxing in that really good hug way. So it's not necessarily going to make you sleepy, although it can for some people. But it's more about calming the nervous system. It's not things like helicopters flying around. Lemon balm can be really nice. to you. This is uh, Rosalie Dillifway. She's a well-known um, herbalist. Um, in her book, Alchemy of Herbs, she refers to one of these studies on using plants like lemon balm for preventing DNA damage. There are a lot of um, different reports out there in terms of looking at how plants like lemon balm can really help us in our modern times with x-rays um, helping our bodies deal with the potential damage from those. So lemon balm not only tastes good, but it's also really supports your body in being the best that it can be. Um, a big way that I use lemon balm in our life is um, the anti antiviral quality. And the term uh, antiviral it's pretty broad speaking. You've probably heard a lot about um, viruses. Is there a question? No, I wanted to apologize for shaking because we just finished working out in the yard for the past three oh. hours. <laughs> <laughs> so our camera person is my near and dear partner in life and we have spent a lot of time out in the yard earlier today um, working on some projects that we kind of put off since March. And it's um, 90. And it's about 90 degrees outside. So we're both doing a little um, um, work hard. So I apologize he wants for to that. He wants to apologize about the shaky camera. So comment if it's distracting and we'll try to fix it. But um, also give a thumbs up if you're feeling like the camera situation is okay. So antiviral. So lemon balm has specific actions in studies with specifically um, viruses like 
Um, the viruses that cause the herpes virus, herpes 1 and 2, and uh, viruses like chicken pox and shingles, which are all re which are related and really similar viruses. So in these studies, lemon balm was found to be helpful at preventing um, the herpes outbreak, both 1 and 2, as well as uh, shortening the duration if there was an outbreak. And in the studies, um, in uses with chickenpox, which we don't see very often anymore, I feel like we see a lot more shingles cases. And with shingles, uh, lemon balm was found to be helpful at decreasing the amount of time it took to heal from these um, experiences, both the internal uh, nerve sensations and the topical healing. Although you would never put anything on your body or consume it and without talking to your doctor first. I'm not here to diagnose or treat anyone. Um, I'm just sharing some of my previous experiences of working with this plant and some things I've read about. Uh, Stephen Hare Jr. Uh, mentioned the shingles protocol and the herpes protocols in the Herbal Antivirals book. I do want to give a little side note. <laughs> Lemon balm tastes really good, smells really good, and in general is pretty safe. Um, I've read in a few places and heard that it can be contraindicated for people who experience hypothyroid. So because it's calming, because it has this general interaction in the body, it's considered contraindicated with hypo but fine if it's hyper because of the calming nature. Um, it could be beneficial actually for hypo. I mean hyper, excuse me, hyper. So, internally, I like to use lemon balm, like I mentioned, in teas. It's really lovely. Um, my current favorite, or continued favorite, I should say, I think I've been saying this for about a year, is lemon balm pine. And pine is a plant that gets its own Sunday. We'll talk about that again in a few weeks, but lemon balm pine is really nice or lemon balm with a few of those elderberries that I talked about a few weeks ago. It can be really lovely to make a tea, especially when it's hot, cools you down. Another way to incorporate lemon balm into your life is by way of a tincture. And a tincture is a concentrated herbal extract um, it's either alcohol or vinegar or glycerin. If you want to learn more about tinctures, we, I'm sure we have a video on YouTube for that too. Um, those are internal uses. And then there are topical preparations as well. Lemon balm makes a pretty decent um, uh, help if you've gotten stung by something. Um, you can chew it up a little bit, call it a poultice, and put it on your skin or that mosquito bite, and it can um, soothe it and cool it down a little bit. Um, lemon balm could be incorporated into herbal oils and used topically that way, especially for those shingle situations. And that would be applying an oil never to an open wound. You don't want to ever put oil on open wounds, um, but really on the, the skin around surrounding any sores, it could be really soothing and calming to the nervous system. Comment? Yeah. It's kind of hard to hear, so you might want to try to speak up a little more. Oh yeah, I can definitely talk louder. Maybe you can turn the volume up. Right. Um, thank you for saying that. It's nice to know now. So another preparation that I really like with lemon balm because it can be either internal or external, and that's an herbal honey. Herbal honeys are so fun because if you're inject putting them in your mouth, a spoonful of uh, honey makes the medicine go down. I think somebody said it was sugar, but I like to say honey. And to make an herbal honey, you start with a really clean jar, sanitized, um, either in a canning method where you're um, boiling water on the stove, being really safe, or I put it through the sanitized set, uh, setting on my dishwasher. And then 
for herbal honeys that you want just for flavor, you're just accessing that wonderful lemony um, flavor of lemon balm, you would really only need about a third of the jar to fill it up or less. Um, even if you're using fresh, it is so aromatic. It would just make that honey taste so delicious and smell really good. But if you're going for um, access to maybe a topical application, something that happens in my life, I have folks really near and dear to me that experience the uh, herpes mouth sores occasionally, and herbal honey, lemon balm herbal honey, makes it go away really fast, almost as fast as the steroid cream, but you can also eat it. So if I'm doing that, I'm going to add a little more of that lemon balm to my jar. And I'm going to make it about half, I'm going to fill it about half of my jar. And this is dried. And then I will fill my jar if I can open it. Can we get it? Maybe. Yeah, I'm gonna need some help. Use your phone. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. So honey is I read somewhere my our our nine year old was telling me recently that in the lifetime of a bee, they produce a quarter teaspoon of honey. And that kind of blew my mind because I'm about to use almost a quart of honey. That's a lot of lifetimes of bees. So I like to use honey um, in the raw state. I like to use it as local as possible. We have um, a connection with a local beekeepers club So this honey has, has been harvested by bees who are someone's hobby, you know, they just like taking care of the hives and letting the bees live and often the bees have been um, rescued from a neighborhood and a tree or something like that and someone decides to make a home for them. My jar is really stuck. So I'm going to let go of that idea. but. If I had honey, I would fill in this jar and it's really thick and goopy and I'm filling up the jar up to roughly here with that honey. And then I'm using usually the smaller side or you can use a chopstick or a butter knife and you would go into the jar and you would stir it with that honey inside making sure that all of this plant material was completely covered with honey. You don't want any little pockets that have air and dried plant material, especially if it's fresh plant material, that leave an opening for potential pathogens. Honey is a great preservative. They have found honey um, in the Egyptian tomb dehydrated but completely fine. No signs of mold or mildew or anything like that. Super dry climate, I get that, but um, it makes a really good preservative. So I'm letting it, this herbal honey, imagine it's filled with that golden delicious honey and I'm covering it with my lid. And herbal honey, in some books you will see that you put the herbal honey little jar herbal honey in a windowsill for a couple of weeks and that's not really true if you it's not like full sun in Florida for a couple of weeks it's more about making sure that it has it's not sitting in a cold dark space at 65 degrees for a couple of weeks which is hard to find 65 degrees in a corner if you live in Florida but more northern climates that's why you will read for herbal honey that you're putting it in the sun because you want to make sure it's warm enough for those plant constituents to move into the honey. So for this one, if it had honey in it, I would get to show you this part. You want to mix it roughly every day. And so if it had honey in it, it'd be really hard for me to just go like this and shake it up because it's so thick. If it's an herbal honey, I just flip it and then all the honey can rise up to the top and the plant material can fall down to the bottom and I know that that is getting really shaken up and a lot of those 
wonderful plant constituent for moving into the honey. And then after two to three weeks, I would open this up and either there are two possibilities if you're making lemon balm honey. One of them is to strain out the honey. So you're getting out the green plant part and you're left with beautiful honey without any of the little plant pieces in it. And that's what you want if you have people in your life that have lots of questions if they see green bits in anything. And that'll work really well. Um, the people in my life that utilize the, the lemon balm honey for those cold sores really appreciate it without all of the plant material in it because if you're using it in that way, you don't want little pieces of plant to end up in those cold sores. So just the plain honey on those. However, the other way is that I leave the lemon balm plant material inside the honey. Then I can use the lemon balm honey on my toast. I can take out a scoop full and add it to my tea blend. And it's, you know, sweet honey with um, some of the plant materials that I'll strain out anyway because of the other teas I have going. If I'm trying to fight a virus that's going around, I might just take a spoonful of that honey and eat it in my mouth. Yum. Um, so that is herbal honey. Any questions about herbal honey? Not yet. No. So making herbal honey. They're super simple. They make really lovely gifts. Lemon balm just smells so fantastic. Um, It'd be fun to try out. So when you're making herbal honeys, when you're making anything, make sure you're labeling it. And when you're putting the label on, I always like to put the origin of the plant material and then the origin of whatever the liquid is as well. So this would be the beekeeper's honey and then the date that I started it. Remember that can be helpful for both preventing and acute situations. Any questions? How long will I be okay on the shelf? herbal honeys up to a year in my cabinet. Um, if you strain out the plant material, 20 years. Um, honey by itself, it's raw local honey, um, has an indefinite shelf life. Sometimes it'll get um, sugared, like the honey will start to um, be, look more like sugar and be harder and we're not moving around as much, but it's still fine. It's been Unless you saw mold growth or something like that, it would be fine for a long time. I don't have my glasses, by the way. What would you do differently if it were fresh herb? So, fresh herb, in most parts of what we call the United States, right? In most places, Georgia, Tennessee, Connecticut, and a lot of other places, um, as long as your uh, fresh plant material was clean and not clean with water still on it, it would have to be dried. Um, sometimes in the past, before I moved to Florida, I would just let it um, dry just a little bit before using it in the honey, just to make sure there was no water droplets from my washing it or anything on it. And then I would put it the same thing, uh, fresh plant material into a jar and you, could go anywhere from a third if you just want the flavor up to about three quarters if you're going more for those um, the other benefits of the plant. The challenge is that in places like Florida I have there's so many molds and fungus spores floating around in the air that when you're using fresh you have to be a lot more mindful of potential 
bad things growing. Like you don't want it to smell like kombucha when you open the jar. Um, you want to make sure that your plant material is super dry. And a lot of the uh, members of the mint family, like lemon balm, don't have a lot of water in their leaves anyway. And so you could be pretty safe, but I just like to put it out there that especially in more tropical climates, you have to be really mindful of making sure you wash um, the leaves and get all the water off and then the process will be the same. Two weeks to six weeks. Mm -hmm. How would you strain it? So straining, you just want a straining apparatus that has holes that are smaller than your plant material. I really like using those um, mesh strainers that come as part of a tea cup set. So the cup is there and then it has this wide mouth um, stainless steel strainer that fits right into the top of that mug and then it usually has a, a cover that comes with it as well. Those work really well because they have really small holes and they will rest right on the top of not just the mug they come with but also any other jar. So what I would do is take another jar that's roughly the size of the amount of the honey that I'm going to be straining and know that whenever you're straining, it takes a long time for it to strain because the honey's thick. Sometimes I'll do this um, while I'm baking something so there's already ambient heat in the air and then I would take the honey with the herbs in it and I would pour, fill up the little straining device and let the honey go all the way through and just keep doing that throughout the day. I usually throw a little, so imagine my strainer is here and um, my honey is starting to fill up, we'll say it's here. So the strainer is on top and I have my strainer here and the honey is dripping down into my jar, but it takes a long time. I would just take a little towel and lay it over top to make sure that, you know, we're in Florida, there are bugs everywhere. Um, make sure nothing decides to land on that because it takes a really long time to strain it. But any straining um, apparatus that you have can work. I even have these uh, like pos little pasta strainers that can work. You just wanna make sure that they're the whole size is smaller than the plant material. If you have a lot of time on your hands and you want to make sure there's no plant material, you can put um, a paper coffee filter in that straining device that you have if you don't have anything that has super tiny holes. That coffee filter on any straining device will work for you. How much lemon balm should you put in a tea? Typically it's one teaspoon per cup. So one teaspoon per eight ounce cup, and then you're adding your eight ounces of water and you're letting it steep about 10 minutes. How long will it be okay on the shelf? So tea, um, if you make tea. And I may be the strain honey. Yeah. So tea, I usually say like a day, um, 24 hours, you, don't, you wanna keep it in the fridge. A tea should stay in the fridge and tastes really good if it's cold. Um, honey, strained honey, um, and maybe the question is about the comparison of using fresh plant and dried maybe. So if it's dried plant, I've kept it on my shelf up to a year. Um, that's taking the plant material out. On the times that I've left the plant material in it, I try to use it within three months um, just to make sure because anywhere you have the plant material, you have the, the possibility of something going bad. So you just want to be aware of that. And the same would be true for using fresh, except if I'm using fresh plants to make my herbal honey, I would definitely strain out the plant material. Okay? Does that answer the question? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about growing. So growing lemon balm is 
the same as any other plant in the mint family. Um, they have um, origins in the southern European regions. Um, they had their root systems are typically pretty shallow. They like well-drained soil, but garden soil is fine. They like a lot of moisture, but they don't want to sit in moisture. So I have this sweet plant and no matter how deep the roots grow, it's generally whatever biomass, like the total amount of green you see above ground, there's at least that much underground. So this plant, super sweet, um, is in this pot that wasn't designed for it to live in forever anyway, so it's already starting to come out saying, hey, I need to give it a bigger space. So I want to give it a bigger space. Now, so I know that its roots will stay pretty shallow and I know that it wants to have well-drained soil. So this pot is one that is not super deep. This pot is great for plants that have shallow roots, but a plant that really likes to have deep roots wouldn't love this pot as much. You'd want to get taller and bigger like this one on the ground. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm putting things in the bottom of the pot that help it to drain out excess water, especially if I'm putting fresh dirt in, so it's going to get more and more compact down to the bottom. I don't want a lot of the soil to just run out the bottom of my pot either. I want to make sure that this plant um, stays really happy and grows. So I like putting plants that are in the mint family into pots for a couple of reasons. One is that they like to take over wherever they are, you know, they are that roommate that if there's an empty spot in the corner, they're going to throw a shoe, you know, they like to just go wherever the, the space is that they have to grow. With that being said, in Florida, their lemon balm, the range is typically uh, zone four through nine. And here in central Florida, I'm more like 19. So I get a little bit hotter than my mint family plants would really like. So I also put them in the pot so that I can adjust them according to what the time of year is. So during the winter in Florida, I might need to water it because it's kind of our dry season. Then during the summer, I'm going to need to move it out of full sun. During the winter, full sun is fine. Um, but during the summer, lemon balm is going to try to, and any, typically any plant in the mint family, is going to try to get away from that intensity of the sun. So it gets leggy. So it sends out, instead of these beautiful stems with leaves growing close to each other, it would get leggy. So these stems would get really long and you would just see like a couple of flowers, at, a couple of leaves at the very end, that's leggy. But for lemon balm, I'm going to avoid that by making sure I have um, materials at the bottom of my pot, like a few sticks that help the soil not get super compressed so the moisture can, can go out. I can use regular Florida sandy soil to fill up most of the rest of my pot. I have some garden soil uh, that's left over that I can throw in there as well. In this soil, you just want to make sure that it drains really easily. So, it, you know, super loamy, um, dense, compact garden soil would not make mint happy. It really wants it to be able to breathe and move around and it likes, it would need soil um, that has a little bit of density. I say Florida sandy soil and folks who live here know that there's a lot of sand but like in the middle of our yard there's a lot of sand in the soil but there is some nutrients and that's what Mint really needs is that combination of the nutrients with the drainage of the sand. So this pot happens to be made of 
a biodegradable material. Coconut. So, this is coconut, yeah. Um, a local herbalist here, Willow Lamont, likes to grow her little plant babies in these because that's all a combination of the coconut pot coming apart and the roots of the plant trying to come through. So this particular um, pot material, I could take it apart, but because this is already starting to come out, I'm gonna plant it in this. Um, maybe take out some of it. But generally you are, in other pots, you have to help the plant come out a little bit because no matter how long it's been in there, it's kind of started to attach the sides. It's kind of like when you make brownies. Sometimes the, the sides get caught up. So you want to just wiggle it a little bit. I like to let my plants know they're about to move, but I promise to continue taking care of them. And then um, for a lot of pot, a lot of pots, you would just turn it upside down and holding it and it would pop out and then I would transfer that into here. But like I said, this pot can go directly into the ground and I just need to make enough room so that the soil line is similar. For those of gardeners out there, you know that for some plants, you want to bring the soil line above whatever it is in the pot. And for other plants, you want it to be a little bit below. It kind of depends on what the plant needs. This is a little bit of a unique pot situation I have going on here. Because I want it to be able to have access to the spreading out, taking over this pot, and it will. It won't take very long and it'll completely fill up this pot. I'll just have to make sure I water it. And anytime you're putting, moving a plant into a bigger pot and you're adding soil, remember that um, it will get more compact. You just, by moving it with a shovel, I've just put a lot of air in the soil and you want to make sure that you take that into consideration and maybe after a few days watering it, you th if you think the soil level is too low, you can always add a little bit more. Any questions? There was one from earlier. Mm. <clears throat> it says, uh, will this be available after this viewing? I missed the beginning. Yes. Um, we'll put it, I'll post it up to our YouTube channel right after we're done here. Okay, so if you don't have a little plant baby on hand, or maybe you have a friend that has a little plant baby but or a big established plant um, and you want your own plant baby um, plants in the mint family propagate from cutting very easily actually lemon balm would probably um, grow well from a seed as well I just happen to have this little lovely um, you want to make sure you're not covering up any of their leaves so Plants in the mint family typically will propagate from cutting pretty easily. So if you have this plant or you know someone who has a lemon balm and you want to have your own cutting, it's um, you look in on the stem and any plant in the mint family will have some stems that are greener and lighter and you can feel that they seem more tender. Those will work better as cuttings. This plant specifically, you can't see it, but um, the older the plant is, the more you'll see stems that are a little harder and more uh, like bark, brown in color. So you just take a cutting from below a node, and there's a little node right there, and then I would take all the leaves off below my water line and I would stick that in the water and I would so there you would never have leaves below your water line um, and I find that mint and things in the mint family will grow from a cutting pretty easily I know there are a lot of uh, products out there root stimulating hormones and things like that but I find in general I don't really need that with um, propagating 
plants in the mint family, they usually sprout those little roots pretty easily. Just remember the roots that they're sprouting in that water um, are not necessarily the same kind of root that they need for the earth. So still be careful, be gentle with them whenever you're taking a plant that you have started in the water and you're putting it in the earth. Make sure that when you're putting it in the earth, you're giving it lots of space. You're not just taking the plant out of the water and squishing up those roots and then covering them up with dirt. You want to make sure there's room for those roots to get out um, on their own in the dirt. Question. Yes. <clears throat> From seed, do you start inside and then, oh wait, I'm sorry, hold on. I thought my glasses I'm having a hard time. Do you start inside and then transplant outside once established? So, um, the question is about trans, uh, starting a seed inside and bringing it outside. So, often when we're starting a plant from seed inside, it's to protect the soil because the seeds are really little. So, if I just put, you know, this little seed on the soil and then covered it up and then I come in with rain, it would flood and that plant that seed would get lost and maybe in a completely different spot or maybe be under too much soil and not be able to survive so it's true with lemon balm and with a lot of other plants if you're starting from seed you just want to protect the soil where the seed is planted from too much movement so those little tiny seeds need to be able to get established and so if you're starting it inside you're probably using a spray bottle or some gentle form of watering those seeds so that those roots can take hold and dig into the dirt so that if they get watered like this plant the plant's not going to um, move around as much even though I'm watering it a lot because it's established it has its roots in place and it's holding on to that soil And you'll notice I'm watering this very heavily um, and I can hear the water starting to go out the bottom of the pot. So when you are first watering, the soil has a lot of air and so the water is going through pretty quickly. So when you first water in, especially mint that likes a lot of moisture, you want to make sure that you are getting all of the soil inside the pot wet when you have in with good drainage. Okay, and you can kind of see where the soil is more um, lo a lot lower than it was before. And I don't want to pack it in too much because those air pockets I want to keep around for that plant to have room for the roots to grow. But there you have it. Lemon balm. Melissa officinale. Officially from Latin. Officially used as a plant in apothecaries for thousands of years. Um, thank you for joining me in the garden today and happy growing. I'll see you next week.